If you would keep your Bibles open to Acts chapter 12. And if you're just joining us, um, we've been studying the book of Acts now for six months. And by the way, I want to say, Pastor Dave, thank you for filling the pulpit last week. It was refreshing to sit under your preaching. So thank you for doing that. It meant, meant a lot to everyone here. We're going to pick back up where we left off in Acts chapter 12. And we're going to be, um, do you realize we've been in Acts now for six months? Yeah, for six months. We were in Luke for three years, right? So we're making good time. Now here, I just want to encourage you. I just want you to know, and maybe you knew this, but um, the first 12 chapters of Acts cover 12 years. So I think I'm making really good time <laughs> going through this book together. Here we are, six months in. Uh, and, you know, here's the thing. Expectations, we all have them. We have expectations about everything. We walk into any relationship, any job, into our church, we have expectations. And, and what we have is we have expectations that may be here, and then we have reality that may be here, and in between is called disillusionment, discouragement. So I want to start off today by asking you to think about your expectations, because the book of Acts, one of the things we're learning from the book of Acts is how to adjust or right-size our expectations. What is your expectation for your church? In fact, would you write that down? What is your expectation for your church? I want to go through a few things that we've already covered in the book of Acts. Um, most recently, we've looked at Acts chapter 10. And we learned in Acts chapters 10 and 11 that God had to change and expand Peter's mind along with a man named Cornelius. Their perspective, their view of life had to change. Cornelius was not a follower of Jesus yet. Peter was a follower of Jesus. God led Cornelius and Peter to meet so that both of them could have their worlds changed by Jesus. Jesus is always altering our view of reality. So you go in with one expectation and you come out with something else. Well, Peter spent some time with Cornelius in his house, and Cornelius was not Jewish. And Peter had to go back to Jerusalem where he came from, where he had a lot of his best friends were very committed followers of Jesus who were also committed to the Jewish faith. And they were troubled by the fact that Peter spent so much time and enjoyed himself in Cornelius' house. And so Peter got a lot of blowback. You see, Peter and Cornelius learned how to welcome a new work of God into their life. But Peter's friends back in Jerusalem couldn't welcome it. They, they had a hard time welcoming what God was doing through Peter in non-Jewish people coming to know Jesus. And so Peter got lots of blowback from his, his Jewish friends. They had critical spirits from within the church. So can you imagine? Can you imagine you have a positive experience, something great that God did. You share with somebody else in the church, and all they do is they rain on your parade. Has that ever happened to you? The difference between expectation and then reality and disillusionment lying in the middle. So I think what we need to do when it comes to expectations, we need to, let's just write this down, expect conflict and misunderstandings from within the church. We need to learn to expect conflict and misunderstandings. If you think you can go into a church and not have conflicts and misunderstandings in the midst of God doing a new work in people's lives, conflicts and misunderstandings. That's what we saw in Acts chapters 10 and 11. We also learned in Acts chapter 11, just as by way of a quick review, we learned in Acts chapter 11 that the good news of Jesus Christ builds bridges because a new church sprung up in a city called Antioch, about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And so the Christians from Jerusalem were scattered, and some of them went to this place called Antioch, this city 300 miles away, and they started a church there. They started leading people to Jesus there who weren't from the Jewish background, didn't have necessarily a Jewish faith. And all of a sudden, the church that they came from in Jerusalem was about to go through a very difficult time. And so one church sends the gospel to the new church. The new church reaches back and shows love and compassion by sending finances to help them through a difficult time that they're about to go through. We saw that this is what the gospel does. It builds bridges. We learned that the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus Christ, hitches our heritage back in Jerusalem to our mission in Antioch. Our heritage and our mission are hitched together. 
And now today's study, as we look at Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, it's a, it's a study of contrasts. You're going to see a lot of contrasts in this, in this passage today in Acts 12. You're going to see a contrast between a powerful oppressor named King Herod, who depends on violence, and that's going to be contrasted with a powerless church that depends on God. You're going to see that contrast today. You're going to see someone who's a political authority having lots of power to change the headlines and affect the way you feel at any given moment if you live during that time. But you're going to contrast that with somebody who's a follower of Jesus, who has the ability not to affect the headlines, but to actually change the world. And it'll never be picked up on the evening news. You see, we have expectations, and then we have reality. Another area that we're going to be looking at, if you want to write this down, is expecting opposition from outside the church. Expect opposition from outside the church. Would you write that down? The church will go through times of peace and popularity, but we better be careful that just because we're in a season of peacefulness and we're popular and people might be coming to church and flocking to church, things can turn around very quickly. Because the church, even if it succeeds and it's growing in one area, it, it, we need to understand that the church is meant to be worldwide. It's meant to flourish worldwide, not just in one location. The point of Acts is what Jesus said at the beginning of the book of Acts, that you will receive power from the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's meant to go in this direction. So the church is, so our expectation is we're going to get opposition from the outside so that we realize it's not supposed to just stay in one spot. It's supposed to spread. And by the way, as we look at this passage, I just want to say this at the outset because we're not going to spend much time, but I want to camp on it for just a, a few moments here. In terms of Peter in the book of Acts, this is the last time that Peter is seen as a central leader in the church. What you're going to read today is the last time that Peter is seen as a central leader in the church because the persecution is going to get so bad in, in Jerusalem by King Herod, it's going to get so bad that even Peter has to leave Jerusalem. And so here's something else that we should expect. In your outline, if you'd write this down, expect long-time leaders to be repositioned in the church. Expect a long-time leader like Peter to be repositioned in the church. God used Peter in so many amazing ways up to this point, and he's still going to be using Peter, but Peter is going to be moved to another place geographically. He's, going to be some, he's not going to be in the center of the story anymore in the book of Acts. Peter's been the leading voice in the Jerusalem church. And today we're going to see that Peter's season of leadership in Jerusalem is coming to a close, and we're going to see that there's another name that springs up in this passage, and it's the name James. James was a common name. James is an apostle whose brother's name is John. But that's not the James who's going to lead the church next. The James that's going to lead the church in Jerusalem is Jesus' half-brother, James who wrote the letter in the Bible called the book of James. He wrote it. And James is going to become the leading voice of the church in Jerusalem, not Peter. Peter no, P, James is going to lead the church in ways Peter never could have. So here's what we should expect. When you go to a church, expect a change in leadership. Oftentimes we can worship people who are in leadership. We have to be careful. Peter's are there for a season, and then James's are there for a season, and God is directing all of this. So would you write this down? Number four, expect new leaders to be raised up to lead the church into the future. Expect new leaders like James, that God's going to raise them up to lead the church into the future. Now, one of the things you'll find interesting as we go through the book of Acts is you'll discover that there's a group of followers of Jesus in Jerusalem who are former Pharisees, believers who are Pharisees, and that's how they self-identify. I'm a Pharisee who is a believer in Jesus, and that's who James 
has to lead in Jerusalem. And you're going to see that when we get to Acts chapter 15, there's going to be a point where the church is about to split in half. And the Pharisees, the Christian Pharisees, in James's church in Jerusalem are leading the charge for the church split. They want to divide people based upon whether or not they've observed certain Jewish rituals from the Old Testament. And that, by the way, is the next time Peter resurfaces in the book of Acts. But James is the leader, and you're going to find out that James had to be the leader of that church in Jerusalem because he had the credibility so that the church didn't split. So God raises up leaders, and it looks messy. I'm telling you what, the church is a messy place. You can expect conflict. You can expect misunderstanding in the midst of God doing a great work, a new work of the Holy Spirit. It's, if you're going to have one, you're going to have the other. And you're going to get opposition from the outside, as you just wrote down. And you have to understand that longtime leaders get repositioned within the church. So don't get committed to Peter. Don't get committed to James. Don't get to, committed to Pastor Scott. Don't get committed to Pastor Dave. And the list just goes on. The list goes on because we are here for a time. And by the way, this is not an announcement. <laughs> I knew some people are going, is he about to go somewhere? No. You know the best time to talk about this is when it's not going to happen. So no, don't go there. But today's passage that we're going to look at is filled with all sorts of ironic situation, irony, lots of irony in this passage. You know what irony is, don't you? It's when something that has an end result that's different from what you expected. The end result is different from what you thought would happen. And so in your outline, if you'd write this down, faith identifies the differences between the appearance of things and reality. Your faith in Jesus you need, to, you need to learn to identify the differences between the way things appear and reality. Let's look with, look with me, if you would, at verse 1 of chapter 12. It says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Okay, let me just focus on King Herod. This is a name that keeps coming up in the New Testament. This is not the same Herod that tried to kill Jesus as a toddler. This is not the same Herod. The Herod was a family. It was a clan. It was a dynasty, the Herod dynasty. And the originator, King Herod, who tried to kill baby Jesus, he had other children and he had grandchildren. The Herod it's talking about in verse 1 is the grandson of the one who tried to kill Jesus. When I say the Herods, that would be like today in America saying, now, I don't want to try to cast aspersions on families, but just so you know, we have political dynasties. If I say the Kennedys, or if I say the Bushes, you know what I'm talking about. It's the Herods, the Herods. And everybody in the, at that, that time knew that is a family that passes on power within the family. And so they're, they're seen as respectable in their time. They, they, they know how the political system works in their day. Herod... The original Herod who tried to kill Jesus was basically a half-Jewish warlord. And what Rome did for the original Herod who tried to kill Jesus as a toddler, Rome said, you can run that region of Israel and we'll give you a title. Everybody likes a title. You know what Herod's title was? King of the Jews. Now, do you understand why when he heard that there was a baby born in Bethlehem who's called the king of the Jews? Do you see why he wanted to eliminate his competition? And by the way, that title got passed on in the family. So anybody who became the next King Herod, as it went down, and in this case, in verse 1, it's the grandson. This is a new King Herod. He also has the title of the King of the Jews. He also feels threatened. Even though Jesus has been crucified, and we know raised from the dead, Jesus' followers are going around talking about Jesus being the king. Now that threatens a political leader. 
And he wants to curry favor with people who want to stop this message. And so he finds out that if he arrests some of the leaders, that he'll be loved politically. He always did what gave him more power and more popularity. The human heart hasn't changed, has it? Look with me at verse 2. It says, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword, period. That's all it says. He had James. Remember I said James was a common name? James is one of the apostles. This James is an apostle, the apostle James. His brother's name was John. John wasn't put to death, but James was. Apparently, Herod said, I'm going to go after one of the original 12 to pacify the people who want to see this message of Jesus stopped. He didn't want to go after Peter initially because he wasn't quite sure if he goes after the, the main spokesperson, Peter, is it going to, what kind of blowback am I going to get? So he goes after a, a, a lesser known group of the 12 called James. And all it says is he cut his head off, decapitated. And it's interesting, too, that when this apostle James is killed, the church doesn't come together and say, who are we going to put in his place? Do you realize that? You remember when Judas killed himself? And then later, they said, we have to find somebody to replace him, so they appointed someone named Matthias. When James dies, they don't find somebody to take his spot. That tells us something. The original 12 were not meant to be replaced. They're done. It's a new season. We're going into a new direction. It's not a role that's permanently passed on from one generation to the next where there's apostolic succession. That is not found, and we see it right here. It, they didn't put somebody in James's place. Look at verse 3. When Herod saw this, that it met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Ah, see, he's watching his opinion polls go up. People liked it. This is good. I killed one. Not the big one, but one of the big ones. I killed him. Let's go after Peter. Let's go after the main one. Then they're really going to like me. And by the way, in verse 2, it says James. In verse 2, it says John. Apostle, apostle. Verse 3, it says Peter, apostle. Three apostles. By the way, this is the last time the 12 are referred to in the book of Acts. Look at, verse, look at the end of verse 3. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, that's Peter, after arresting Peter, Herod had him put in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Now think about that. The Passover. The Passover was going on. The Jewish Passover was going on in Jerusalem at the time. Herod wanted to make sure we got past that. What was the Passover? Do you remember what the Passover was about? The Passover was instituted when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt many, many years before. They've been observing the Passover for years. The Passover is a time where God's people celebrate that God delivered them as slaves in Egypt, the Passover. God intervened. And what are they doing? Think of the irony of this. They're remembering when God delivered them in the past but yet they're seeking to put to death the representatives of Jesus who are offering them deliverance from their sin today. Do you see the irony of that? W would you write this down in your outline? Would you write down, um, number one, lip service to past deliverance while opposing today's deliverance? They talk about how, oh, this is the Passover. We have to observe this when God delivered God's people in the past. And then, but yet we have somebody who's bringing us the message of hope. And we're putting them to death. 
Human nature is full of these type of contradictions. Look at verse 11. Skip down just a little bit to verse 11. Look what it says here. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel, look at what the word that Peter used, rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. So I want you to realize when you're reading this story today in Acts chapter 12, I want you to realize that you've seen this movie before. You've seen Passover. You've you've read the book of Exodus where it happened at night, where there was an angel involved. And an angel, and, and they were told, get dressed quickly. And get dressed quickly. And by the way, the seas are going to open up. And in this case, the gates are going to open up. And God is going to rescue you. There's a parallel. There's something that we need to think about. Because God hitches our heritage to our mission. We don't unhitch from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we see Jesus as the deliverer. Look with me at verse 5. Go back up to verse 5, if you would, where it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Do you see that phrase, earnestly praying to God? Literally, it means they were stretched out. They were stretched out. They were stretching themselves out to God. It's the exact same phrase that's used in the Gospels when Jesus was praying in the garden the night he was betrayed. The day he was praying in the garden and he was stretched out. He was earnestly praying. He, he prayed so earnestly. And remember, he brought a couple of his disciples like Peter with him and he said, hey, would you guys stay awake and pray for me? I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to meet with God, and I'm going to stretch myself out. I'm going to earnestly pray to God because I don't want to have to go through what I'm going to go through on this cross, and I'm going to ask God to take this cup away from me, and I need you to pray for me. Would you please stay awake? And so Jesus goes and prays. Remember the story? And then Jesus comes back to them, and what did he find them doing? Sleeping. Jesus said, please wake up, pray. Wake up and pray. Wake up and pray. Look at verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was what? Sleeping. By the way, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad that Peter was sleeping. I think maybe we should see this as a blessing that Peter could sleep, knowing what was, he was facing the next day. You know, maybe the reason Peter could sleep is because there were people earnestly praying for him. You know, there may be times that you go through a tremendous trial so hard that you can't even sleep. You can't even pray. You're like overcome with it. And then you start sharing with other Christians, other brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're praying for you, and you can just feel this peace come over you. You can feel this presence sometimes where you can actually get a good night's sleep that you couldn't get for a long time. Do you understand the power of prayer? That sometimes God keeps some people up, earnestly stretched out praying so that other people can sleep. The gift is sleep. And look where Peter was positioned. Look what it says at the end of verse 6. It says, between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Would you write this down in your outline? Sleepless prayer during prayerful sleep. That's really ironic, isn't it? Not what we'd expect. Look at verse 7. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Now remember, he's chained to two soldiers. Peter's asleep. Verse 8. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Verse 9. Peter followed him out of the prison, but had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. 
Verse 10, they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they'd walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. So I asked myself, how does that happen? How, how, does, how does an angel, a holy angel, appear, physically manipulate something uh, right there in front of you like chains, and it doesn't make sound to wake up the people who you're chained to? How does it happen so real for Peter? It's really an angel. An angel intervened and invaded our reality and changed it. But the soldiers didn't wake up. The soldiers didn't even see it. How do they not see the bright light? How do they not hear the chains? How do things just open up? Now, by the way, these soldiers, you're going to find out later, they're executed because he got away. Roman soldiers, if they failed their duty, if one person, if one Roman soldier failed on guard duty, all of them were executed. And that's what happened. Came across a story this week that just taught me the power that this story conveys. There's a missionary from way, way back named John Patton. He was a pioneer missionary. He brought, he brought the good news of Jesus Christ to a little island, the Vanuatu Islands. It's just uh, northeast of Australia. And he brought it to, he, he and his wife both went there to reach a tribe of cannibals. That's risky. And he told the story of how when they went there and started their mission to try to reach these people for Jesus, uh, how angels protected them. Uh, the, the, here's a picture. Here's a picture of, um, of John Patton. You can tell how old he is. Back like in the 1860s. We're talking a long time ago. And I see the map there. There's, there's, there's Australia. There's the little islands that he, he worked in, those islands. And one night, he and his wife were sleeping at their, I guess, their mission headquarters. And, and um, a, a, a bunch of the, the tribe that didn't want them there um, showed up, and they were intent on burning down their house and killing them, most likely cannibalizing them. And... Uh, John and his wife prayed all that night that God would deliver them. They were filled with so much terror. In his diaries, he talks about what they were praying, how they were feeling. He said, God, we don't know how, but deliver us from this. We, we came here to tell them about Jesus. And when daylight came, they were amazed to see that the tribes, the tribesmen had, had just left. The attackers had, had just left. And so obviously, they just thank God. Lord, thank you for answering that prayer. Well, years later, they were there for a number of years. Le years later, the chief of that tribe came to faith in Jesus Christ. The chief of that tribe was there that night when they were going to try to kill John and his wife. And so John Patton asked this chief, you remember way back when, why didn't you guys burn down our house? And here's a picture of that, that tribe. Here they are. This is the picture of that tribe. John Patton asked the, the chief, you know, why didn't you, why didn't you burn down, why didn't you burn down that house? Why didn't you do what you were going to do? And the chief said, Well, who were all those men with you? And the missionary John Patton said, Well, it was just my wife and I were in the house. We were praying. And the chief said, no, 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 there was a whole bunch of men there. We saw them. There was hundreds of big men with large swords surrounding your house. And we didn't want to mess with them. And so we just left. And at that point, John Patton knew that God had sent angels that John and his wife never saw. The guards never saw. The angels invaded our physical reality, and they do physical things with actual people who can see them, and it's real. 
So the appearance of things versus reality is really important in this story. And when it comes to angelic ability, would you write this down, number three in your outline? Underestimating angelic ability while overestimating human ability. We tend to do that. We think we can do it all until we encounter, like they did in in Acts 12, or like John Patton did, an angel. And you see, we think we have all the power, we have all this ingenuity, we can figure out how to do this. As we go through this story, you're going to see that Peter watched the angel open a gate. No one taught, the angel opened the gate. But Peter, when the angel leaves, Peter's standing in front of the gate of the house trying to get let in where they're praying at the prayer meeting, and he can't open the gate. Peter doesn't have the ability to open that gate. So we tend to underestimate angelic ability. We tend to overestimate our human ability. Look with me at verse 11, if you would. Verse 11 says, Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Verse 12. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. His name is John Mark, where there were many people who had gathered and they were praying. By the way, this must be a pretty big house. Look at verse 13. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. And they said, you're out of your mind. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Okay, let's just, let's try to process what's going on here. They're earnestly praying, God deliver Peter. God delivers, no, that can't be Peter. We've just been praying about that. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't fit our reality. That doesn't fit our expectations. And what's really ironic, it's a female slave who sees the reality first. A female slave. It says servant in your Bible. Literally, she was a slave. And she, was, she worked. She was owned. She was a piece of property. Her name was Rhoda. And the thing is, is Peter had, must have had regular contact with her because she recognized Peter's voice. She'd heard Peter speak, probably teach in their house church, the church that met in their house. She probably knows Peter's voice from some very distinct voice. She hears the voice. She doesn't even have to open the door. She just hears the voice, and she goes back and says, it's Peter. So I want you to see the dynamic within the early church that a powerful man like Peter, influential person like Peter, a leader in the church like Peter, had contact with people who were powerless like Rhoda. So a female slave saw the reality, and guess who thought she was crazy? Everybody else. Do you see the irony of that? Would you write this down? Number four, making the powerful, no, I'm sorry, the powerless, making the powerless people like Rhoda think they're crazy while creating a narrative that denies reality. And that's what was going on. The church, no, that can't be. No, you must be making this. It must be his angel. It must be his, you know, we don't know what. It it can't be that. They're making stuff up. By the way, what you have written down there, there's another term for that today. They call it gaslighting. Have you ever heard of that? When you gaslight somebody, when you make them think they're crazy, Look at verse 16. But Peter kept on knocking. That kind of ruins your reality. I mean, no, it's got to be his angel. Okay, the, it's, we're, hearing no, we're all hearing a knock. Okay, it's, what's going on? What's going on? And what are they? They're arguing. Oh, it has to be. What is it? It has to be this. And she's going, no, it's Peter. I heard him. He's there. He's right there. Look at verse 16. Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Yes. Peter, verse 17. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described 
how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And what does he say? Notice this. There's a transfer of leadership right here. What does he say? Tell who? James. That's the half-brother of Jesus. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this. He said that, and then it says he left for another place. When you look at verse, when you look at verse 17, this is another example. You've seen this movie before. You've seen it before. Do you remember in Luke chapter 22 through 24 where Jesus was, it was Passover, and someone named Herod was involved along with Pontius Pilate, and they were laying hands on Jesus at night, and they were arresting him, and they were handing him over. And do you remember something about a tomb, and there were angels? And do you remember who went to the tomb and saw it was empty, and they went back and they said, it's empty, and they go, you're crazy, because you don't believe what women have to say. You can't believe the testimony of women. But Jesus appeared, and angels spoke to the women who were powerless, And everybody was trying to gaslight them. No, that can't be the case. And then when Jesus appears to his disciples, you see, we've seen this movie before. When Jesus appears to his disciples alive from the dead, they're astonished. They can't believe it. And he's talking with them. And he shares a meal with them. He's having conversation with them. And then he's gone. After the conversation, he's gone. Look what Peter did. He talked to them in verse 17, and then he left for another place. Verse 17. Now look at verse 18. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered, there it is, that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So Herod's ego is damaged. He couldn't come through with another political stunt to raise his opinion polls. He couldn't. Peter got away. Herod leaves Jerusalem. He's humiliated. He goes somewhere else in his little territory, and he's overseeing things over there. And here's some background to what happened. Look at verse 20. Here's where Herod went. Verse 20. Herod had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and now they joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. So it was about food, and he had to get politics. It's the same thing. Verse 21. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes. Now, think about this. Herod's wearing his royal robes sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. By the way, I found out historically outside the Bible, there's a man named Josephus, a Jewish historian who was writing for the Roman Empire. Josephus talks in detail about this same scene, and he adds other historical things about Herod. He said that Herod wore a shining silver robe, and he wore it on purpose so that when the, and it was in the middle of the day, so that when the sun would hit his robe, it would reflect off into people, and he would have a glow about him like he's a god. That's what Josephus wrote outside the Bible. Let's keep reading. Verse 21. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on the throne and delivered a public address to the people. And they shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. Verse 23. Immediately, Herod, immediately because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. And he was eaten by worms and died. Okay, historically, how this happened? It took five days. But the point is, he died. He had to leave the scene immediately. He died five days later, according to Josephus, eaten by worms. Why is this in here? Look at verse 24. Here's why it's in here. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Would you write this down? Number five, the powerful are rotting while the powerless are flourishing. There's Herod with his shining robe, glittering on the outside, powerful, and he's rotted on the inside. And here's the church. Here's the followers of Jesus. No political power at all on the outside, 
but they are growing and flourishing on the end. It reminds me of something Jesus said about a mustard seed. It looks pretty inconsequential, but look at what it can grow up to become. That's how much faith you need, a mustard seed. There's this passage in Isaiah chapter 40 that says this, the grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. So in this message today, and you have your outline in front of you, What's going on inside of you? Is there something about power that you're reaching for that really you're not addressing issues of your heart that need to be? We don't want to be like Herod, rotting from the inside. Pay attention to your heart. Do you recognize God's deliverance when it comes, or do you just give lip service to it? Are you able to sleep? Because maybe you don't have the strength to pray yourself. And others pray you to sleep. Um, Are you overestimating your own ability in something? Is there something that you've been told is true that you're realizing, no, he's really standing at the door and knocking. It's really happening. And you're not the crazy one. The rest of them are. It's not about appearances. It's about reality. And only Jesus can change our reality. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us this passage and preserving this scripture for us. We're so glad that we can look at this and and take our expectations to it. We ask that you, Lord, would help us to recognize with eyes of faith what's really going on behind the scenes so that we can see you in a whole new way. Lord, you've given us these ancient words, and they're so true. It might not be popular, or it might be be something people look down on, but Jesus, you didn't leave us with nothing. You gave us your word, and your word is what lasts forever. Help us to fix our eyes on you and your word, which is eternal. Everything else fades away like a flower and like grass. Thank you for your words that we have confidence in. For it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. I want to invite the prayer partners to come forward during the prayer. And during the song, 